Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Animating objects has long been the province of the bard, the sorcerer, the wizard, also in earlier editions of the game, the cleric. Some digging and clarification on how these wondrous things are made revealed that, strictly speaking, it should be relatively simple to dispel the magic that animates them, and in some cases the object can be the subject of an arcane disjunction that completely ruins the magic that created them. In 5th edition, the examples found for animated objects in the monster manual have a resistance to being dispelled in the form of hit points, which is fine and dandy, until the magic user in the party of adventurers asks you as the dungeon master exactly how many hit points an actual dispel magic spell does to the these animated constructs. Have you got an answer to that question? Because I don't, neither do the designers of 5th edition, because they sidestep that issue completely with a specific rule that applies to animated objects called anti-magic susceptibility. We'll talk about that in a moment, I think it's quite a brilliant idea actually. First though, particularly for those who have never played the earlier editions of D&D, I can tell you something of the ecology of the animated object, and just what goes into making them. These are not simple levitated bits of paper or trapped elemental entities who move around an object, they are actually invested with some of the mind of the spellcaster who made them, in a complex lattice of twisted weaves of magical flows. So there is a force and a charge, a dynamism, will, um, a will, an intense mental effort to both craft and breathe a semblance of life into these marvels. Back in 3.5 edition, a bard could make one for around 153,000 gold pieces, and would sell it for just over 300,000 gold, so it's fairly lucrative. Clerics would find it a lot easier and cheaper at only 99,000 gold, and sell the object for just under 200,000 gold. However, crafting the object is certainly difficult, and the actual ritual to breathe life into this object is very tiring, very personal, very involved, very draining, taking the character away from their normal life, their career, their fame and their reputation would diminish a little bit as they're secluded away in some secret workshop, probably for months at a time, completing this master work of magic. This was previously represented, elegantly enough really, by a cost paid in the experience points of the character. Keep in mind that in the earliest editions of the game, characters progressed quite slowly and past a certain point, the level of the character was less about their amazing personal abilities and more about their rank and influence on the wide the world around them. It's kind of lost sight of that a little bit over the years. Either way, the spellcasters could um, who could make such an item are very high level non-player characters. They would most certainly be very well known in the uh, in your world, um, the game world that you're uh, the game the world that your game is set on. Certain individuals might be well known for their particular style of animated armor with some sort of stylistic motif that a bard in the adventuring party might instantly recognize, giving warning to the rest of the player characters that the armor is heavily enchanted and may pose a threat to them. You may want to make a secret note of the bard's passive perception and passive well, let's call it their general knowledge, so it would be their passive intelligence score, because while wisdom will draw their eyes to the fine details, putting the background information of critical importance with these visual clues is where the bard should excel. It's like, hold up, your character notices something unusual about that suit of armour in the middle there, Martha. Your years of studying tales of famous wizards and artificers has enabled your character to recognise the unmistakable owl and rose petal etchings on the suit of Mal uh, Malandrian's marvellous mercenary armour, which, sure enough, starts to move slightly as you urgently halt the party at the entrance to the area. Nice one, Martha, your bard saved the party from a surprise attack by the animated armour. Yes. You can make an arcana check to see what else you know about this magical foe. You get the general idea. Bardic knowledge is one of the best things about the character class, if you ask me. Animated armor, flying swords, and smothering rugs are just three examples that we find in the core monster manual of what is possible. But they cover the basics. There are so many possibilities, though, which I shall talk about a bit um, in more detail in a moment. Basic properties common to all animated objects is that they're not alive. They can't be harmed by psychic or poison damage. They are immune to being blinded, charmed, deafened, frightened, paralyzed, petrified, or exhausted. So they never get tired. They never stop. They have a limited sensory range, only able to detect what's going on within 60 feet of their position. They, this is called blind sight, but it's more like a field of magic that is disturbed by any objects or motion within it. So the only way to switch it off switches off the animated object at the same time. They usually have a fairly low passive perception score, always under 10 anyway. 
so it's quite possible to sneak past them without being detected. They all have a false appearance, so until they demonstrate that they're animated, they just look like ordinary objects for the most part. As far as I know, they're not magically protected automatically from the ordinary wear and tear and the passage of time, nor do they uh, magically repair or mend themselves, so they probably just get rusty and decayed as they sit around for years at a time in a tomb or a dungeon. But then, Perhaps they get patched up frequently, or they're cared for by someone that they're programmed not to attack. Or if they're actually in service to a mage or someone the mage has constructed the animated object for. As mentioned, they are all vulnerable to being temporarily deactivated by having their magic dispelled. Now, since they don't, they, they do actually make a constitution saving throw. You could, if inventing a very robust and very large animated object, give it a high constitution of tribute, thus uh, giving it at least a couple of points bonus to the roll, but it would have to be something like an animated, uh, animated adamantium siege engine or some such, some huge, really tough thing. Movement speed varies. The um, armor suit can move at 25 pe feet per round. There's nothing to say that it cannot dash, just like a character can. The sword flies at 50 feet per round, or 100 feet if making a, an air dash. That's still only about 11 miles per hour, so not that fast. In fact, speed for fast objects and creatures in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is something that doesn't convert very well in realistic terms. 50 feet per round is fast and maneuverable over a limited area that combat takes place in, but as the Dungeon Master, if that sword has to fly after some character um, that it's protecting, say, or, or you know, basically programmed to look after or a company and that character is plummeting to the ground have the sword rip through and plummet to the ground with them and have the uh, character hold on to it to save themselves with an appropriate strength check to grab it and withstand the jolting force of their body's inertia well then by all means have that magic sword ignore its normal limitations and rocket through the air with a speed of 600 or the equivalent of 68 miles per hour, or a smidge under 110 kilometers per hour. Same thing with the smothering rug. It may look a bit like a flying carpet, but it doesn't actually fly. It slithers along the ground at 10 feet per round, or again, 20 feet with a dash action. This means that yes, you can ride one, who needs a flying carpet when you can ride majestically on a slowly slithering one? Feel like a snack while studying hard at your spell books? Just whistle and your table full of snacks and beverages will scoot across the room at your, uh, with your own protective guard rug carrying it. If you need to send an enemy off in an unexpected manner, simply replace the rug in their home with an animated replica, programmed to activate in the evening, hunt down their sleeping prey and murder them in their bed. Animated bed sheets or pillows will also do the trick. In fact, a simple animated robe could be quite nasty when you think about it. Why bother hunting down a known criminal, for instance, if the enforcer of the law can just program a set of manacles to go after them? How about an animated boulder or anvil? A very simple weapon of literal mass destruction. It flies up, it plummets down. Rocks fall, you die. Or who needs the time and expense of building, transporting, paying for a crew and all the time to operate a trebuchet when a simple pile of great big metal barrels can be filled up with lamp oil and used to float over and flood a castle from the sky. Then a few flaming arrows and it's all over. Why anyone would build a castle aside from sheer vanity in the D&D world is beyond me. Animated objects are not intelligent. They're just a tool. They only do exactly what they're constructed and programmed to do. They cannot react and adapt to the circumstances. They do not act to preserve themselves from harm. So when you're running, uh, when you're running one of them as a dungeon master, put yourself in the shoes of the mage who made the object and imagine that they have a very limited set of instructions that they can give to the objects during the ritual. So if it falls outside of what the mage could manage to program at the time, there's no way that the animated object is going to be able to do it. They may see a thing coming at them which is capable of destroying them, but they're not able to comprehend anything. They just physically carry on as programmed, no matter what. A great example of this is the magical mop and water summoning bucket that the sorcerer's apprentice um, almost causes a disaster with in that old Disney movie with Mickey Mouse. You may note that the animated armor only has a simple slam attack. The flying sword just does slashing attacks and the rug simply wraps around a single target, albeit very, very tightly. The animated armor cannot pick up and use a sword or um, other weapon, unless it has a sword built into its arm or something. The actual use of a sword is far too complicated for it to handle. 
as a general rule, say your bard was a, also a skilled swordsperson, then perhaps they could program it to use a sword, but nothing else. So there are three examples provided that can be endlessly expanded and adapted to all sorts of different objects, from hovering pl platforms to arsonist tin tinder boxes, self-propelled battering rams to something as complicated as a large orary displaying the movement of every planet in a local celestial sphere. Imagine a sword propped up in a rock um, getting automatically sharpened by an animated whetstone, while a suit of plate armor is being methodically oiled and polished by an animated cloth. Something as simple as a pair of forks that can skewer a game animal and act as a simple floating rotisserie, or an animated kitchen knife that peels and chops vegetables all on its own. What a treasure such a family heirloom would be, and I imagine they'd be fairly commonplace. If I was a wizard and I was making something for myself that took months and months of effort, I probably wouldn't expend my first effort on something as magnificent as a suit of armour when it could go co co so many ways it could go wrong. Why not just make yourself a steak knife that carves steak for you, just to test it out? So, a deceptively simple monster listing in the core monster manual actually has a whole world of clever possibilities to the imaginative dungeon master. And I think the goal of a player character mage may well include the ability to cast this sort of enchantment to create an anim animated object of their own. Just a food for thought. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for more exclusive content and all the full scripts to these videos. Buy some merchandise if you're so inclined, where you'll geek with pride. Also check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back for more for you very soon.